invited um, Dr. Nessler here tonight, both because the topic is particularly interesting um, and it's a value that I think many of us should care about, but it's also part of a series we have uh, that began at the High School Days when I spoke about uh, racial justice. Um, John is here with us now. Um, in January, we have Evan Trailer coming, who is, was the first um, NIFTI president, our youth group, national youth group president, um, young man of color elected. And he's going to talk about what it was like growing up in a reform synagogue as a young man of color. In February, Dr. Ellen Prell is going to come and talk about um, Jews and whiteness, or parentheses, how Jews became white in America. Um, and we say that with a lot of quotation marks around it because obviously it's hugely problematic, especially thinking about like the yeah, Jews of color. So this is part of our attempt at this as a congregation to try and delve a little bit deeper into the issues of the day. Um, and I am really, really glad, Dr. Bessler, you're here. And uh, please come up to the beam. It's yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I did want to thank uh, Tom uh, for we're friends of Susan Siegel and Mike Franz, and so um, it was a party actually Tom suggested I get talk with the rabbi and, and he followed up. Uh, so uh, and thank you, Rabbi, for, for having me. Uh, it's going to be hard competing with the music uh, on this topic, the death penalty, capital punishment. I actually just got back from a three-day seminar in Oslo, Norway, in December on capital punishment, which sounds pretty grim, right? Um, but actually, Oslo is a very nice place during the winter with the winter markets and, and so on. So. Uh, the topic I want to speak about tonight is, uh, are we at a tipping point with, with capital punishment? Um, and actually, uh, lawyers don't often get referred to as doctors. Uh, uh, I technically have a doctor degree, but, uh, and the physicians on this, on this point are actually ahead of the lawyers. So the uh, physicians have already taken a position against the death penalty uh, and consider it unethical to participate um, in, execu in execution. But the lawyers are a little bit behind the, the doctors on, on this uh, particular issue. Uh, so what I'd like to do is, is start off by talking a little bit about the history of the, of the death penalty. Uh, so the death penalty has been around, we know, for, for centuries. So the Code of Hammurabi, one of the oldest uh, legal codes provided for the death penalty. Um, in uh, Jewish law, there's actually uh, 36 different um, offenses were punishable by death. It's always tricky for a Catholic to be lecturing from a guy about Jewish law, but, uh, but uh, Jewish law did have um, provided for the death penalty. But Jewish law also made it incredibly rare uh, to inflict the death penalty. In fact, there was uh, uh, some rabbis who talked about how, even though the death penalty was authorized under rabbinical law, that uh, uh, there would be 23 judges in the death penalty case, and there had to be a unanimous uh, determination among those uh, judges. Uh, there was unanimity to something that uh, was easy to, uh, to get. Uh, and that there was also a rule that people that were sitting in judgment could not be cruel people, but had to be compassionate people. Uh, uh, there was also a rule about rigorous cross-examination of witnesses. Uh, you could not use confessions or even circumstantial evidence in cases that were presented to the rabbinical courts. So in fact, the death penalty was, was extremely rare to the point that uh, there was a, a saying about how if a uh, rabbinical court handed out uh, a death penalty every seven years or every 70 years, that it was a bloody Sanhedrin. So uh, in fact, given the unanimity rule, Alan Dershowitz, who's a very prominent uh, law professor at Harvard Law School, said he remembers in, in, in when he was doing his studies in the Talmud uh, that uh, he learned that in, even in the case where there was a, a, a unanimity, uh, it was decided that they could not impose the death penalty because the fact that it was unanimous indicated that the person had very poor lawyers. <laughs> Uh, 38, uh, but that was a, a, a big event 
uh, in Mankato, historically, but one that was not really talked about a great deal uh, when we were growing up. It was something that the town was certainly uh, proud of. Um, I then went to law school and then started working on uh, death penalty uh, cases, and actually Barb Fires here and Barb running the Advocates Human Rights. There's been over 100 lawyers in Minnesota recruited to work on death penalty cases. Um, I had the uh, honor to work on uh, a few cases when I was in practice, in private practice at uh, Fedor and Benson uh, the law firm. And what you see when you see those cases is some of the, the incredible uh, lack of quality of representation uh, in those cases. Uh, they, it was not the kind of reputation that uh, Alan Dershowitz talked about where, uh, where, where, where they, well, it was, was the kind of representation he was talking about, where there was just such a poor representation that that's why uh, the person was, was sentenced to death. Uh, so I started writing about the death penalty, and I think once you know something about the subject, there's some, some sort of obligation to, to tell the people about it. And I started my research by looking at, at uh, the history of why it was that executions were done uh, after uh, midnight, shortly after midnight. And I found out that uh, a very popular time used to be one minute after midnight was when executions in the United States took place. And that uh, led me into asking the question, well, why is that? And the reason was that there was an, an effort to sort of stifle the debate um, about uh, the death penalty. And so we've seen a lot of um, progress over the last uh, 250 years, and actually brought a visual aid along. This is my most recent book. But the reason I brought it is because this is the person, who was the first person to write a comprehensive um, book against the death penalty. It was a book called Crimes and Punishments. It was published in Italian. Uh, the, the, the Italian name was Di Felice del Pene in 1764, uh, and this was this book, um, the anniversary of the publication of the book, uh, the 250th anniversary of the publication was last year, and there was a lot of conferences all over Europe, and Europe, of course, now is the death penalty in its own because Europe has signed um, two different protocols to the European Convention on Human Rights. Protocol number six um, abolishes the death penalty uh, during peacetime, and protocol 13 now abolishes the death penalty in all circumstances, including war or imminent threat of war. So the Europeans are now uh, essentially a death penalty free uh, continent in Europe, uh, and they've actually taken steps to ban the export of lethal injection drugs in the United States, which has in effect reduced the number of executions in the United States uh, since that time. Uh, this, this, this year, uh, the Death Penalty Information Center in Washington, D.C. puts out statistics, and this year there was uh, 28 executions, which is the lowest number in quite a long time. The number of executions peaked at around 98 back in the late 90s, and since then we've seen a decline. Back in the 1990s, there was over 300 people per year who were being sentenced to death, and now we're more in the 50 uh, uh, range uh, of death sentences uh, this, this last year. Uh, so there's been a big change uh, in the United States in the, uh, the way in which the death penalty um, is, is being carried out. Uh, and if you look at the United States as a whole, uh, there's still 31 states uh, with the death penalty, but in a lot of those states, the death penalty has not been used in a very long time. So Kansas, for example, has not used the death penalty since 1965. So it's just 2% of U.S. counties that are uh, using, the, the, actively using the death penalty in terms of the, of the majority of executions. So 2% of executions, or 2% of, of all counties account for more than half of all executions uh, nationwide. Uh, Minnesota, as some of you may know, uh, Phyllis is here I see, uh, Minnesota legislature. Um, uh, Phyllis was not around back then, but uh, uh, the, the, the Minnesota legislature abolished the death penalty back in 1911. And we have not had the death penalty since that time. There was a, uh, some lynchings up in the loop in 1920, but in terms of the state sanctioned executions, we've not had the death penalty for for over 100 years, and Minnesota is a pretty safe place to, uh, to live. With the, with the statistics for a place like Texas, which is the, the leader for executions, has a much higher um, homicide rate. So I want to take you back through a little bit of history, uh, for just for a few minutes. Um, Cesare Pecoria, the, the writer I talked about, is Italian, was a product of the Italian Enlightenment. He wrote this book on crimes and punishments when he was uh, 26 years old. And in that book, uh, he argued against torture um, and against the death penalty, but he wrote about those things in separate uh, chapters. Uh, back then, the death penalty was not considered to be a, a torturous act. Even under today, under international law, 
uh, it's not considered an act of torture, although uh, I, I would argue that it, it should be categorized in that, in that framework. Um, in fact, mock executions are considered to be torturous acts under international law. So how is it that a simulated execution is torturous, but an actual execution is not? Sort of a curious uh, wrinkle there in, in international law, you might say. Um, so uh, when Beckley wrote this uh, this book, this was a very novel idea that the death penalty should be abolished. But his writings created a big stir uh, in Europe. People like William Blackstone, famous uh, English legal commentator, read his work and commented favorably, uh, favorably on it. Um, uh, Jeremy Bentham, who was also a penal reformer, commented favorably, said that Beckley's work was received uh, by the intelligent as an angel would be by the faithful. Um, and in the United States, um, even though Beckery never came to the United States, uh, on crimes and punishment was, punishment was aptly read by all the early founders. Uh, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson bought a copy of the book in 1769, just a few years after it was uh, uh, translated into English. Um, and uh, Jefferson also read the book in Italian, in fact, copied over 20, uh, 24 passages from the book in, a, in the original Italian into what was called this commonplace book, which is how lawyers uh, studied uh, back in the old days, writing maxims and things like that from, from different sources. And so uh, the book was well received in the United States, but the problem was that there was no penitentiary system yet in the United States. Uh, in the United States, uh, if you go back to the 18th century, uh, like in Connecticut, they were using a copper mine for a prison. It was essentially a dungeon, a place to put people. They didn't really have a place to put people who were dangerous for long periods of time. It was only after the development of the penitentiary system that you have the ability to have a viable option to uh, incarcerate people who will be dangerous to society and keep, keep the public safe, but at the same time not uh, have to use the death penalty. So in uh, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania was the first state to, to uh, to put uh, murder into different degrees, divided into first degree murder and other types of murder. Uh, and that was in uh, 1794. And since that time, a lot of other states have also done the same thing. So some crimes are not eligible for the death penalty. Um, in, in some places, first degree murder still is um, eligible for the death penalty. Uh, but we've seen a successive restriction on the use of the death penalty. So in the United States now, you can no longer consider unconstitutional to execute the insane. Uh, those with intellectual disabilities, uh, juvenile offenders cannot be executed. Those who do not play um, uh, play a major role in a crime uh, cannot be executed. And so there's a lot of categories of people who are now ineligible for the death penalty. So the death penalty is kind of a shrinking uh, phenomenon in terms of who's actually um, eligible uh, for it. Internationally, uh, we have now a lot of activity going out in the United Nations. Uh, there's been uh, several five uh, moratorium resolutions introduced at the United Nations General Assembly, and there are um, over 100 countries, and the numbers in, has been increasing with each vote, uh, who uh, say that there should be a moratorium on the death penalty. In fact, internationally now, there's, there's uh, only around just over 20 countries that are actively using the death penalty um, each year. And so we have about four out of five countries that are not actively using of the death penalty any longer. And so to the extent that uh, the death penalty exists, um, you still see it uh, largely in North Africa, uh, in the Middle East, and in Asia. But even in those places, there has been some efforts to curtail the death penalty recently. Uh, and there's certainly discussions, uh, ongoing discussions in those places. But right now, the United States um, and Japan remain really the only two highly industrialized um, countries uh, to, to use the death penalty. Israel um, still has the, uh, the death penalty for uh, a limited uh, category, but has not used the death penalty in a very, very, very long time. Um, Adolf Eichmann was, was, was somebody that a lot of you probably heard about, um, who was um, executed, but even terrorists are not uh, executed in Israel. In fact, under inter international law now, under the Rome Statute, uh, the Rome Statute is the, is the statute that created, it's international law that created the International Criminal Court. Uh, under the Rome Statute, uh, the maximum penalty for uh, the worst of the worst crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, is a life sentence. Uh, so if 
that is the maximum penalty for the worst of the worst crimes, then one of the concepts that Becker had talked about in his book was this concept of proportionality, that the crime has to be proportionate, the punishment has to be proportionate to the crime. And uh, how can you then have a lesser crime be punished even more severely? Um, the, the, the Constitutional Court of South Africa actually held the death penalty was unconstitutional more than 20 years ago. So I think in the United States we're seeing right now a, a really interesting um, exchange among jurists and lawyers about the death penalty. Uh, the Connecticut Supreme Court uh, just this year held that the death penalty was unconstitutional under the state constitution. The U.S. Supreme Court has not yet done that, but uh, two justices in the Glossop versus Gross case I love the title of that opinion, Glossop versus Gross, um, have called in their dissent for a re-examination of the constitutionality of death penalty itself. So Justice uh, Breyer and Justice Ginsburg have asked that that be done. Uh, so that's, that's kind of a, a, a brief update on, on the death penalty. Uh, if you go back through history, you see again, starting in uh, 1786, in Tuscany was the first state, uh, to the first country to abolish the death penalty, then Austria in 1787, the same year as the uh, Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. Just a few months in March of that year, uh, Dr. Benjamin Rush was assigned to the Declaration of Independence called for the total abolition of the death penalty in the United States. So this movement has been going on a long time. Uh, in, the, in the 1840s, Michigan became the first, uh, kind of, or first state of the English-speaking world to abolish uh, capital punishment for murder. And then we had Wisconsin and Rhode Island in the 1850s. But the Civil War um, sort of uh, put Becquerie's uh, humanitarian influences, which had been very great in the founding period. John Adams, in fact, quoted Becquerie's book at the Boston Massacre trial. Um, and James Madison pushed the legislation in Virginia that Jefferson had drafted that, that attempted to drastically curtail um, the use of the death penalty. And there was an effort to move from a system of sanguinary laws, called bloody laws, to the penitentiary system. And we're still on that path today. I, I like the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Shabbat reading tonight that talked about there's a better place, a promised land, and the winding way to that promise passes through the wilderness. And I think uh, the death penalty is a wilderness. If you look at the cases, very disturbing kinds of things in the cases. Um, violence is very disturbing. But we have to remember that the crime is about what the criminal does. The punishment is about to reflect our values as, as citizens. And the Shabbat reading ended that there should be no way from, that there is no way to get from here to there except by joining hands marching together. And so that's what you're seeing at the international level. You're seeing countries coming together to end this practice. It's still being used in places like Iran, um, uh, Yemen, uh, in China. But these countries are not uh, democratic countries. Uh, they are authoritarian or even totalitarian. Uh, countries and uh, to end the death penalty, uh, something that had been used by monarchs in the past to keep suppress uh, uh, their subjects, um, and also has a long history of racial discrimination as well. Uh, we didn't get a chance to talk about that very much, but uh, there were cases recently argued for the U.S. Supreme Court that I had a chance to go to. Stephen Bright, um, who is uh, uh, runs the Southern Center for Human Rights, argued a death penalty case uh, called Foster in which one of the things that happened was that uh, in death penalty cases, there's a, uh, a jury selection process. And actually, uh, juries are, are what we call death qualified. Everybody who sits on a jury has already promised that they would be willing to consider the death penalty. That's a, lot, a little different than the perspective of Jewish law uh, on this issue. Um, and if you think about that, if we now have about half the people who say that they prefer life without parole to the death penalty, but those people are being excluded from sitting in judgment in the cases. And then the Supreme Court, in its own Eighth Amendment uh, law, considers two things in assessing the evolving standards of decency to, to decide whether punishment is cruel or unusual. That is legislation and jury verdicts. So the, the data that they're getting is, is, is skewed by the, by the very law that they're allowing to, be, uh, to, 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 uh, to, to use. Uh, so, uh, I'll end there. I'll stick around for a few minutes after the, uh, the, the service if you have any questions. But uh, uh, thanks for listening, and uh, you've been educated a little bit about this issue.
Mr. Thank you. We have a tradition of not clapping for speakers. I sort of don't you think we're being rude? Um, and in your honor, um, we, um, the congregation, um, is making a donation to the Advocates for Human Rights to keep this work um, uh, going. So thank you very much for teaching us, and I hope folks will ask him more questions during uh, the opening. <laughs>